Good afternoon, everyone. Sister Mercy, Sister Uduka, Brother Mayo, what you said, God bless you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Sister Felicia, good, good evening. Good afternoon, ma'am. And uh, I'm lost without you. Oh, Father, we worship you this evening. Hallelujah. This is the Oh, oh, oh. This is the This is my deliverance. And uh, I'm desperate for you. Oh, and uh, I'm lost. Pastor Charles. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm very spiritual. Good evening, everyone. And uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. I thought of you today, no, yesterday, I wanted to call you. And I was just thinking about you. That's oh, it's been a long time I spoke to you, Pastor Charles. <laughs> I will find time to talk to you tomorrow, sir. Sister, good, good evening, good afternoon, ma. We have a very, very special session today. And uh, because of our meeting on Saturday, I moved the session on Saturday back to today, backwards to today so that we can have enough time to look into the world and uh, to feed on a very important subject I began about two weeks ago, why the same Bible is producing different Christians. Why the same Bible is producing different Christians. And uh, I made, oh, good afternoon, ma, Sister Doris. Pastor Doris. <laughs> no, I did, I did, uh, I used an analogy when I, when we had the first session, uh, I happened to, to be a process engineer by my training. My first degree was industrial and um, production engineering. And uh, over the years, I specialized in quality engineering and process engineering. And so that background has helped me to understand what is the dominant focus of organizations when they make products and services, when they offer products and services to their customers. So I've worked with Coca-Cola before. I've been on the production line of Coca-Cola. I've worked behind the scene in the diamond manufacturing company 
called the bears in South Africa. I have been on a diamond mine inside the forest, mining the hull of diamond. And I've worked within the processes that bring out the product from the raw material. So I have a very strong orientation of how organizations plan their products from conceptualization to the final delivery of the products end to end and so that background has helped me to understand that when any organization for example let's use toyota or general motors or uh honda any of these blue chip multinational companies they don't make one million brands of a vehicle they make good evening ma'am good evening sir they will make only one brand for example mercedes benz would make only one brand that brand will be called prototype and then they will subject that one brand that one prototype to so many tests they will test it for stress they will test it for speed for reliability for safety and they will subject that vehicle to a lot of tests now when the vehicle passes quality assurance tests and they are sure that this vehicle will not cause an accident for the user then they will mass produce the prototype and then they will produce like one million units of a single prototype and then the one million units sometimes they produce them using two generic approaches there is one that is called make to stock make to stock that is they make vehicles and they stock them you just stock them and stock them in different with different dealers different delivery centers and shops and then there is something that is called make to order make to order they don't make the vehicle they won't manufacture and produce one million copies or one million units if they have not received an order for for such vehicles so they can actually do make to stock or make to order or they do what is called an hybrid, hybrid production system so they have some vehicles they have made and they've kept them in their manufacturing um, facility or they make vehicles based on a previous order from different countries now why am i going to these details of engineering i'm going there because i see a similarity between that and what i'm about to say now the bible is the prototype the prototype of the chief manufacturer who is god himself for the believer in christ for the christian the bible is the prototype that bible has been given to us as a manual for living manual of destiny now from the prototype from the bible comes logos and rema because the bible is made up of the written word and the revealed word this is books of the bible they are the written word and like i've always said many times the bible is not the words in the bible are not all statement of truth but they are all truly stated what does that mean and judas hanged himself is a scripture in the bible does it mean that every christian should use that scripture to 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 guide the affairs of their life and we begin to kill ourselves around and hang ourselves no it is not a statement of truth but it was truly stated so the bible will truly state events the way they have happened but not every single scripture is our value system the Bible is a combination of the lives of so many individuals, the wicked, the good, the bad, the ugly, all the wicked kings of Israel of, of, of those days, the Amalekite, the Jebusite, who did all kinds of horrible things. But the written word is the basis for the revealed word. The written word is the basis for the revealed word. What does that mean? God will not reveal any other, any other word to you and I that contradicts the written word. There is no 
that must contradict the written word. God has spoken to the fathers by the prophets, but in this and that statement is extremely crucial. God has spoken, meaning that God is not ready to say anything different from tell me that God has spoken to you that you have to marry five women. That that is a special revelation to you. It contradicts the written word. It is not from God. It is not from God. So the Remember, about logos, you will enter into trouble. Because you will come up with all kinds of revelation. I will say, God has, God has told me to do it. God has told me to do it. And we have that example all across the globe. So many people coming up with different brands of revelation that contradict the written word. That is what makes the Bible a unique book, incomparable with any other book in the world. So let's go back to the engineering analogy I was given. I was given. The Bible has been proven, has been tested, and has been delivered to us as a manual for living. So anyone who comes to Christ, who has received Christ, the life of that person, his value system, his behavior, his character must be shaped by those 66 books, and in particular, the New Testament. Because we are in the new dispensation now. Now, why is it that a South Korean that has a Bible, who is born again and is reading the Bible, the behavior, the character, the values, the result of that South Korean will be different from the lifestyle and the behavior and the result of a man living in Gabon. And the behavior and values and character of the man living in Gabon will be different from the behavior and the character of the man living in Congo. Now, the problem is not the Bible. The problem are the people. Just like when Toyota is making a car, the same Toyota vehicle is driven on the same U.S. road, driven on the same German road, driven on the same Congolese road. The problem is not always with the vehicle, but the users of the vehicle. So if the roads in Nigeria are bad, the Toyota vehicle will behave differently, could behave differently in Nigeria than it will behave in Germany, where they have one of the best roads in the world. <laughs> and that is where the problem is. The same Bible, but different Christians. It's a serious problem. The same Bible, but different Christians. And that is not supposed to be so. The same Bible, the same word of God should produce on the average believers with similar values. We will be different in certain areas, but not in values. The same principles, the same values, the same doctrine of scripture should shape and regulate our life so that if you meet any believer, anywhere you go, they are just like Jesus. A believer in Congo is like Jesus. A believer in Nigeria is like Jesus. A believer in Germany is like Jesus. A believer in, in Afghanistan. A believer in like Jesus. Why would a believer in South Korea be different? Why will a believer in Syria be different in behavior and character from a believer in Ghana? The Bible is not the problem. God's word has been proven, settled forever. The Bible says forever, oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. The problem we are having is not God's word. The problem we are having has to do with us, the people. The people. And that is the focus of my teaching this evening. We had a fantastic session last Saturday. I will look at the roadside believer. We used Mark chapter 4 and Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower, as our basis. And we look at the four. 
all went out to sow, some seed fed, fell on the roadside. I will consider the roadside believers as believers who are like unbelievers. They, are, they claim to be believers, but there is nothing in their life that mirrors the character of Christ. In fact, to a large extent, they are not born again at all. But they have our form, they speak our language, they do the same thing, they pretend, and they think they are Christians, but they are not. And let's go to the second category today. Mark chapter 4 verse 5 is our anchor scripture. While the sower was going to sow, the Bible says some seed in verse 5 and verse 6 of Mark chapter 4, some seed fell on a stony ground. And because the ground did not have much depth, the seed quickly germinated, and when the sun came, it withered. Now it took me a whole week to understand what this scripture means. I kept thinking about it. I kept thinking about it. I kept thinking about it. I kept, how can a believer be described with these characteristics? Who are the believers with stony hearts? The soil went out to sow, and some seed fell on a stony ground. And I was thinking about it. Can a believer in Christ, in Christ have a stony heart, a heart of stone? It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't fit into my theology. It didn't fit into my theology. Because in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 26, God was prophesying through the mouth of Ezekiel that I will give certain groups of people a new art, a art of flesh. That was a prophecy that was given by Ezekiel for the days we are living in now. Ezekiel was prophesying are speaking about people who will give their heart to Christ. That God will give certain set of people a heart of flesh. So when I saw that scripture, and I look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, brand new creature. So I said to myself, why will a sower go out to sow, and a seed will fall on a ground of stone? And that ground of stone refers to a heart of stone. So I was a bit confused. Can a believer has a heart of stone? But the heart has been made born again. God has changed our heart because anytime you see the word heart in scripture, he's not speaking about the physical heart that is pumping blood. He speaks to the spirit being, the nucleus, the real man, the real you. That is what the heart means in scripture. So when the Bible is saying, I will give them a new heart, God wasn't saying he's going to transform our physical heart. Change. When you get born again, your body, the color of your skin remains the same. Your hair remains the same. Your eyes remain the same. Your spirit might receive the life of God, the zoe of Christ, and was transformed. We have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. And so I was confused, and I began to look at this scripture. Why will a believer in Christ have a stony heart. Have a stony heart. Why will a believer in Christ have a stony heart? A heart of stone. The sower was going out to sow, and some seed fell on a stony heart. And let me not deceive you, God's people. Please help me share this teaching. If you look at Mark chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, when the sower went out to sow, the seed dropped on the stony ground and because there was no depth the stone sorry the seed germinated quickly and then it withered away so i began to dig into scripture and i found a scripture in hebrews chapter 3 verse 8 and verse 13 hebrews chapter 3 verse 8 and verse 13 and apostle paul was writing no 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 the writer of hebrews the writer of Hebrews, whom many people believe was Apostle Paul, he was writing and he said, Do not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Do not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Let me read Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8 to you. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8. Listen to this scripture. Hebrews 
chapter 3, verse 8. Harden not your eyes as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. That is Hebrews 3, verse 8. Look at Hebrews 3, verse 13. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Paul was not speaking, sorry, the writer of Hebrew was not speaking to unbelievers. He was speaking to Christians, believers in Christ. And my eyes just popped open. And the Holy Spirit told me, it is possible for a believer to become hardened. We are in a generation. Hallelujah. We are in a generation where we are having a lot of ardent Christians. A lot of them all across the globe. And I'm going to tell you what it means to be ardent now. <laughs> the writer of Hebrews said, Hebrews 3.18, Do not be ardent by the deceitfulness of sin. He was writing to believers, not to unbelievers. Do not be ardent. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. And not one he was speaking to believers. Exhort one another daily. And do not be ardent by the deceitfulness of sin. So, what does that mean? A believer in Christ can get to a stage in his life that he can become hardened to the word of God, the true word of God. A believer can get to a point, he can become hardened. He can willingly harden his heart. We are all free moral agents. You have the capacity to release yourself to God. You have the capacity to harden your heart to the voice of God. Yes. How many times has the Holy Spirit spoken to you and I and we refuse to, li to listen to it? I, I won't stand here today and tell you that I have obeyed the Holy Spirit every time. There were times I disobeyed him and I paid dearly for it. I have shared the story of when I was going to the, I was coming from the US to Canada about three years ago, four years ago, and the Holy Spirit told me not to enter a particular plane, that I should switch my seat for somebody who was on an emergency and needed to fly. And I said no, and I heard the voice of God clearly. And I had the vo if you if if you hear God, if you if you have heard God, if you are very close to God, if you have a strong relationship and you nurture that relationship with the Holy Spirit, when He's speaking, you will know. <laughs> and I had in my heart, it was God that saved me that day. I entered the plane, not after 15 minutes. There was trouble in the plane. All the circuit and electronic system in the plane shut down. It shut down and the plane began to vibrate. And I started shouting, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the pilot said, I have been flying this route for the past 19 years. I have never experienced this problem before. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we have to go back to the US. He was looking for emergency way, um, for a place to land. And he was telling us, everything is fine. There is no problem. I didn't know that there was a problem. It was when we returned to Atlanta that I saw fire brigade. I saw paramedics. I saw ambulances. They were expecting a crash. The circuit system in the plane, the electronic system of the plane, control everything in the plane. Remember what happened in the Boeing 737 MAX. If there is a problem with the electronic function of the plane, it is disaster. And the Lord said to me, you are the Jonah in this plane. You are the Jonah. You are the Jonah. I said, God, my wife, my children, my ministry. I was, ah, in that, you, may you never experience that in your life. The, and the trauma that that thing cost me in subsequent journeys, the trauma, I will enter into the plane, I will get anxious. The experience I had four years ago, it was bad. It was a man of God and God and the believers I didn't know that, that, that they were praying for me. When I eventually landed, a man of God said, what, that around 8.15, that he began to pray. And my wife told me that the, the man had a burden that they, that they should be praying. They should be praying. They should be praying. And I was on board 8.15. Ah, God is merciful. God is faithful. I was in the air yeah, exactly the same time. The man was just praying. They didn't really know the reason why they were praying. They were praying. 
And my wife said the man was praying. It was like he was carrying a burden. He was praying. I hardened my heart. A believer can harden his heart. Your heart can be hardened. We have a generation of Christians arising in this end time. Some of them, if not many, have hardened heart. I call them hardened Christian. They are hardened to the true gospel. They are hardened to the word of God. They do anything they like under the guise of grace. Anything I like, I can do. Christ has paid the price. I can do anything I like. I can change women. I can marry four. I can take any contracts. I can do anything. I can take alcohol to stupor. I can go to club and do anything I like. It is my heart that is born again. Whatever I do with my body is not. That is called adding. Adding. Addness of hearts. There was a time Jesus was speaking. And the Pharisees asked Jesus. They said to Jesus. They said to him. Moses gave us the right to divorce our wife. Jesus said to them. Moses gave you that law because of the hardness of your heart. But from the beginning, it was not so. A man, even a Christian, New Testament Christian can harden his heart. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Apostle Paul was speaking. Sorry, the writer of Hebrews was speaking. Do not harden your heart. Do not be hardened by Mark chapter 4, verse 6. When the sower was sowing, some seed fell on a stony ground. And that ground represented the heart of man. So the seed is the word of God, meaning that the word of God can rest upon a heart of stone. A believer's heart can be resistant to the word of God, to the true gospel. Whatever I will do, I will do. I don't care what people are saying. This is what I'm going to do. I am going to marry that man. I don't care. I am going to do this. I don't care. I don't care. It's my life. Don't judge me. <laughs> myself and my wife this afternoon this morning we're having i was taking out to a place so we're having a discussion in the car and we're referring to someone and and uh, the scripture came judge not <laughs> i told my wife that scripture has been has been misapplied god, god wasn't saying that we should not correct people in love, instruct people in love rebuke people in love you better not get to a stage in your life no one can correct you you better not the person the father loves, he chastises. God still disciplines his children, even in the New Testament. Apostle Paul said it. The person I love, I chastises. There was a time Paul had an affliction. He said he was praying to God, take away this affliction, because I won't take it away. I won't take it away. My grace is sufficient for you. There was a time one of the apostles was giving Paul some problems, and Paul said, I have handed him over to the messenger of Satan for some discipline, for some chastising, so that the spirit can be saved on the last day. Now, I am not saying you should be judging people and killing them and saying, go and die, go and be sick. That is unchristianly. But what I'm saying is this, you better not get to a stage in your life, you can't be chastised, you can't be corrected. I can be corrected by anybody. About five years ago, I went to a church. I was in a church, and I was a minister in the church, and I wanted to use the restroom. Very funny story. And they had only one restroom in that church. So I went to the restroom. When I got to the entrance, outside of the main door, I saw two children on the queue. They were waiting to go into the restroom. And I was so pressed. The children were like four year old, small, small boys like this. But they were standing ahead of me, two of them. I was number three on the queue. You know, I just whispered to the ears. I said, please, can you allow me to go in? <laughs> this, the, the small boy said, but I came before you. But I came before you. And I, 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 I felt, I felt disciplined by God. I felt humiliated by God that at your age, with your level of exposure, you want to usurp your authority and take over the place of these two boys because they are small boys. Go and kill. <laughs> of course, the motive was not to oppress them. I was so pressed. 
So I felt that these two boys were not pressed. You know what happened? When the first one entered the washroom, the, the, the restroom, he stayed there and enjoyed himself. You know when children entered the restroom, he was playing. He was looking at the mirror, playing with the tissue. I was hearing him releasing the water. Ah, I said, Jesus Christ. When he came out, he satisfied himself. The second one went in. Four, four year old, five year old boy. And I was, I was burning. I was groaning. I was suffering behind the door. There was no other one, I mean, restroom in the church. When I came inside and they were done, and the Lord said to me, that is your discipline today. You learn how to obey the queue. <laughs> you join the queue. Of course, I don't break the queue. I join the queue. But what I'm saying is that God can teach people with any lesson at any time. A small boy can teach you a lesson. Your son can give you an instruction. I know a man of God. God had been calling him into ministry. He did not listen to God. He worked, he worked with, 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 with a world, I think World Bank or United Nations. I'm not sure. But God had been calling him to abandon his work and God preached the gospel. The guy refused. One day he was taking his seven-year-old boy to church. And the boy looked at him in the car. Dad, when are you going to start preaching the gospel? The man did like this. Dad, when are you going to start preaching the gospel? God will use every method to speak to you. The God of the New Testament is not a docile God. Do not be deceived. The Bible says, whatsoever a man sows, he shall reap. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7, Apostle Paul wrote that scripture. You can be reading one section of Paul's writing and cover the other section. You will not be a balanced Christian. You have to balance everything together. You will read some scriptures, it will appear as if Paul is giving people ultimate right and authority to live anyhow. You are free in Christ. Let nobody put you in bondage. You will read another part of Paul's writing. He will say, whatsoever a man sows, he will reap. Ah. So if you have not read that one, you will read only one, you will run away with that scripture, you begin to do anything. Paul has given us authority. I can do anything I like. My spirit is born again. My body can do anything I like. No. Your spirit, your soul, your body belong to the Lord. Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Apostle Paul said that in the book of Corinthians. So you can't say your spirit is born again and your body is your own possession. No. Your body, your spirit, your soul, they belong to God. So I don't live a compartmentalized life. My spirit is the Lord's. My body and soul belong to me. No. The three of them must walk in unison. If your spirit is born again and you allow your body to behave anyhow, your body can go to a brothel, your body can smoke, you will kill your body before time. And you may not even go to heaven if you are not careful. If you are not careful. So a Christian, a believer in Christ, will ensure that you focus on your, on your soul, you continue to renew your mind, and then you offer a body to the Lord like a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2. Present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. In other words, kill your flesh every day. Apostle Paul said, I die daily. I die daily. What does that mean? He constantly works on the flesh. He said, what I want to do, I am not doing. What I don't want to do, I am doing. Say, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Unfortunately, this body will not be made completely perfect. Completely perfect. It is a mortal body. That is why we all die when our time is up. Spirits don't die. When your time is up, your spirit goes back to your maker. Bodies will die because it is a mortal body. It is ephemeral. It is transient. It doesn't last forever. It is mortal. That is why the Bible says that after the rapture, mortality will put on immortality. Corruption will put on incorrupt. I mean, uh, a, 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 a corrupt body will become incorruptible. So a believer can harden his heart. Now the question is. There are so many scriptures that speaks that speak to some things that can be done with our hearts. Though your heart is born again, though your heart is transformed, 
at the new birth, your heart can be enlarged. Apostle Paul was praying for the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, that your heart might be enlarged. Though their hearts have been born again, but it can be enlarged. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul was saying to the to the Corinthians as well that your that 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 God will give you a heart on which the gospel will be written. A heart that the gospel can be written upon. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. A heart of a Christian can be broken. So there are many things that can happen to the heart of a man that is born again. So I'm not speaking of the heart that is pumping blood. I'm speaking to the nucleus, your real man, your real man. Now let's go to the main cruise of the message. What are the things that add in the heart of a believer? What are the things that harden the heart? Not an unbeliever now. A believer in Christ can be hardened. Let me tell you a story. I learned it from Kenneth E. Hagin in one of his books. Now, Kenneth E. Hagin said he went to visit his grandfather during the days of depression in the U.S. in the 1940s. And it was a, an extremely cold evening. When he got to his, to his grandfather's house, the man was in his backyard, and Kenneth E. Hagin saw him. He was boiling water for coffee. He put a large pot on a, on a oven in the public in the public space and was boiling the water and then the water began to boil and his grandfather poured coffee coffee into the pot and the coffee was boiling was boiling so the grandfather picked a jug dig the jug inside the boiling water and drank everything can i think he said he screamed and grabbed his throat his own his own throat like as if he was the one taking the coffee he said this kid, imagine you taking a, a taking a jug, digging it, dipping it into a boiling water, and drinking everything. He said the grandfather laughed. Ah, and he said, Grandpa, what is this you have done? He said the man laughed. The man said, I didn't start to drink a whole jug of boiling coffee in a day. It took me many years. I began with a sip until my tongue and throat became tempered and hardened and canada said the holy spirit picked that thing up so that is exactly what happens to a christian a believer in christ you begin to do things and then god is warning you and then you are relaxing and then you are going back god is warning you a little pornography you watch it again then you stop then you watch it again then you repent then you go back then you watch it then you repent then you go back you beat your wife today slap her tomorrow oh i'm sorry it was a mistake no she, she she forgives you next week you kick her again then she forgives you next month you you box her again after three four five years you become hardened you become hardened toughened you become toughened You become toughened. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 will not happen. Do not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You become toughened. You are repenting. You are going back. You are repenting. You are going back. You are repenting. You are going back. You become toughened. And then you can dig a jug into a boiling water of sin and drink it. That is why you see a believer, a pastor. You say, God has told me to marry a second wife. This is an aberration. This is a sacrilege. He will damn all consequences and will go to church on Sunday, declare and announce to the church, and he will continue to behave as if nothing has happened. He has become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And that hardening process, it takes a while. It didn't become, nobody gets hardened in a day. It's a process. A process, a process, and then you become hardened, and it is a deception because the Bible says, Do not become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It's a deception. Why is it a deception? There is grace. When I repent, God forgives me. So you take advantage of the grace and mercy of God, and you begin to do the same thing every day. 
until a time comes, you become added. So the problem now is not about forgiveness. God will forgive because of Jesus, but you are damaging your conscience. You are damaging it, damaging it. Until a day comes, you become a full-blown dictator. You are a dictator. Anything goes. And people will be talking to you say, yes, forget about Christianity. Let me tell you who I am. In my tribe, in my father's house, we don't take nonsense. You shouldn't have slapped that man. I will slap him again if he tries that thing. That is the place of hardened art. That is when a Christian does something without remorse, without a feeling. That is when you see a pastor doing things without remorse, wickedly. And people are saying, are you not a man of God? So forget that thing. Forget that thing. I will show you that before you are born, I started preaching. And the man we unleash is fury on you. He has become ardent. Such kind of people will not produce the kind of Christians that will be commensurate in values and standards with some other Christians who are living right in some other countries. Do not become ardent. So the first thing that adds a believer is unconfessed and habitual sin. The same thing. Unconfessed and habitual sin. Just doing the same thing. So the people that are stealing money, robbing the poor, pastors that are robbing people, they did not start like that. In fact, more than 90% of pastors that have gone into heroes, they didn't begin like that. They didn't. A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. That is why any time you find yourself in the midst of wickedness, you cut it off. You stop it immediately. Because if you allow wickedness and error to germinate, to ferment, it can become a mighty tree with branches of evil. At that time, it could be difficult to tame. It will be a full-blown monster that will be difficult to tame. What will people say? My, my church is now under 1,000 members. What will I say? What will I do? If I stop preaching this same doctrine, people have known me for it. They will stop inviting me. I will lose members. I will lose income. I will lose relevance. I will lose fame. I will lose... So it becomes difficult. They will now be bringing in palliatives. Palliatives, palliatives. Do not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So, unconfessed habitual sin is probably one of the worst hardness. Things that harden a Christian. Number two, the love of money and money itself. The love of money. Tell me something that toughens people like money. The Bible didn't say money is the root of all evil. The Bible said the love of money. However, if you have not been processed by God, because intelligence can take a man to the top, only integrity will keep him there. If you have not been processed by God, a certain amount of money enters your account, you can become hardened. Many years back, that should be like 17 years ago now, there was this bank MD in Nigeria. It was a bank MD. So he went to a church, and he was sitting in the church, and the pastor was preaching. The pastor said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eyes of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The man started laughing. The man started laughing. The MD of the bank. It was later on that we knew that the MD had stolen a lot of money from the bank. He had, he had enriched himself corruptly. So when the pastor was preaching, he was just laughing. A kind of a laugh of mockery. What is this I'm talking about? I'm talking about money. Money. Money is a natural adna. If you have not been prepared and processed by God, there are certain amount of money that will not give you sleepless nights. There are certain amount of money 
that when they come into your account and you have them at your disposal, it will distort your character if you have not been prepared by God. That is why some of us, we are looking for opportunities to become more wealthy and those things are not happening. And we are very angry with God. And God is saying, you are not ready yet. You are not ready yet. Let me prepare you. Let me prepare you. And I've preached it many times. There are three stages in the life of every man. Let me run it in two minutes. There is a stage of revelation. There is a stage of preparation. There is the stage of manifestation. Three of them. Revelation, preparation, manifestation. And I look at the lives of God's generals in scripture, most of them can be categorized into those three layers. Between the age of zero and 17 was Joseph's revelation. He had a dream. Between 17 and 30 was Joseph's preparation from the pit to the palace. From the palace, he was going from place to place. And then from 30, he entered the palace. Manifestation. From the age of 0 to 17 was David's revelation. He was anointed by Samuel. From 17 to 30 was David's preparation. He wasn't king until 30. From 30 and above, manifestation. From the age of 0 to 40 was Moses' revelation. He thought he was the deliverer of Israel. And he wanted to do it in his own power. And he failed. And God banished him into the wilderness. From 40 to 80 was preparation. From 80 to 120, manifestation. I mean, it. you can fit in so many people into it. Even the Lord Jesus did not escape it. From 0 to 12 was Jesus' revelation. 12 to 30, preparation. 30 to 33 and a half, manifestation. Now, if you are not prepared and you want to jump from revelation to manifestation, it is disaster. It is disaster. And that is, if you look at your life, you can categorize your life into that layer. There are some people, by virtue of how God deals with them, sometimes imagines those layers. They happen concurrently. It depends. I mean, different individuals with different agendas with God. So if you get money when you're not a prepared person, I mean, money is, I call money one of Satan's weapons of mass destruction. Look at all the problems happening in the Middle East. You will trace it to money. Why is America going over the world? Pulling the strings of diplomacy. They want to be in charge. If you are in charge, you are not just in charge by mouth. You are in charge economically. America is not just the greatest country in the world because they've got atomic bombs and weapons. No, they've got money. Five individuals in America, they, are, they, they carry weights. Dozens of nations in the world are running after them. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, um, this Amazon guy, Jeff Bezos. I mean, these guys carry weight and all of their businesses are in the U.S. So collectively they are paying tax to the u.s government the u.s government is making trillions of dollars so and they want to remain at that level so that they can control the whole world so you cannot divorce divorce money from some of the decisions they are taking north korea syria afghanistan nigeria everything revolves around the love of money remove money from the equation of nigerian politics and then the true leaders will emerge. The true leaders will emerge. Remove money from Nigerian politics today. The true leaders will emerge. That is how powerful money is. And I'm emphasizing this because a lot of Christians have shipwrecked their life because of money. Nothing is wrong with having money. We need money. But having it with the character of Christ having it when you have been formed when you have been formed there is certain amount of money that will never come your way if you have not been prepared for it that is why in my book god or mammon i explain that 
Prosperity is in three categories. And I'm emphasizing this section because of someone. Prosperity is in three categories. Third John verse 2 says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. In that one verse are three categories of prosperity. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. The thou there is the real you. Meaning, God's ultimate agenda above all things is that the real you prospers, which is spiritual prosperity. Because the real you is your spirit man. So God wants your spirit to prosper. How does your spirit prosper? Relationship with Christ. You must be born again. Now look at the arrangement. And being health, standing for physical state of prosperity. Even as your soul prospers, standing for intellectual prosperity. So we've got spiritual prosperity. We've got intellectual prosperity. We've got physical or material prosperity. And it must start with spiritual prosperity. I am speaking for, 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 for my Christian from, from a Christian Christian perspective now, forget about people who are not believers. They can rearrange that order the way they like. It doesn't concern me. <laughs> Spiritual prosperity is number one. So if you reorder it and you put material prosperity on top and spiritual on the last, you will miss it. The spiritual prosperity is the foundation. That is what we shape and guard your life. You've got the fear of God. You've got a mind for Christ. When that foundation is there, the next to be built on that foundation is intellectual prosperity. You've got a sharp mind. You go to school. Your brain is sharp. You are a sharp thinker. You are a smart thinker. You are a strategic thinker. And that can be done. I did a whole series on that. That can be acquired through a lot of things. Strong education. Exposure. Now, when you are a spiritually prosperous person and intellectually you are sound, you can never be poor. You can never be a beggar. You can't be poor. You are spiritually sound and intellectually you are very sound. You can't be poor. I'm not saying you'll be a billionaire. I mean, you can't be poor. Because <laughs> that is a relative statement. Because money is in degrees. What is somebody else's measure of wealth is somebody else's achievement 10 years before or 30 years before so let me not go into that now because a major area that i've taught in the past extensively what am i saying money or even the love of money can harden people that is why rich people are the most difficult people to get to christ they look at you from head to toe. What do you have? See, what do you have? They look at you from head to toe when they have money. Most of the rich people in the world, they are not believers, not Christians, because they look at you from head to toe. What do you have? <laughs> what do you have? It's always difficult. That's why Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the high of the needle than for a rich man. Then now said, Whatever is impossible with God is sorry, impossible with men is possible with God. I am not saying rich men can't know Christ. There are a lot of rich men that are born again and sound filled with the Holy Spirit. There are many of them, but there are still a vast proportion of them who do not want to have anything to do with Christ. Number three, what can add in a believer? You are a believer, you are born again. What can get you to a point that you have become added? The word of God has no influence on your life at all. When you have friends around you who are ardent, you see, that speaks to relationship. The Bible says, He that walks with the wise shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You can never be wiser than the relationship, the most dominant relationship you keep. If all the people that surround you are God haters, you can never love God. You will not. I am not speaking to 
casual relationships. People you meet in your office and you just walk for eight hours. I'm talking about your closest palace that you share art to art. If you have friends that are hardened, they are believers in court, but anything goes. They have girlfriends. There are pastors that have girlfriends. Ha! They are married. Don't let me start saying things here. <laughs> They are married. There are pastors that have girlfriends and they are married. And the church is packed with people. There are believers that are engaged actively with corruption in their places of work. And they are spending money from corruption to build houses, to buy houses. And they will tell you they are born again. I'm a believer in Christ. I love God. If those guys are your friends and you share heart to heart, you will be hardened. They were hardening you, hardening you, toughening you, toughening you, toughening you, until you get to a point you become a full-blown dictator. <laughs> you know a dictator? Somebody who gives instruction. is very autocratic. He doesn't believe in negotiation, in dialogue. He just stands up like Idi Amin of Uganda, like Mobutu Sesaseko of Congo. And he gives instruction. You must carry it out. That is what I want. That is how many Christians are now. That is not the will of God. One of the values of the kingdom of God, one of the fruit of the spirit is love. And when you love, love and hardness cannot coexist. You can't claim to love God and you are hardened. No. No. Look for people that love God. Make them your best friends. Women, men. Look for married women that love God. Men, look for married men that love God. When you have issues with your wife and you speak to them, they carry the love and fear of God and they share it with you and tell you, my brother, let me pray with you. No, what you are doing is wrong. Oh. They will be defending your wife. When you report your wife to them, they will tell you, ah, ah, you are wrong. Your wife is right. And they will be putting the fear of God in you. This is the kind of friends you keep. If you keep friends, it will tell you, you are very stupid, though. Women are not like that. You are carrying a woman matter. Women are, they are not so important like that. You will show her that you are the man of the house. <laughs> you will show her that you are the man of the house. Buy a ticket. Go to Africa for three weeks. Make sure you create distance between you and your wife, and then she will respect you. If that is the kind of friends you are keeping, you will become hardened, toughened, toughened. And the toughness doesn't happen in a day. It can happen over 30 years till you become a full-blown dictator. And your wife will say, I married this man. He was like a baby. What has happened to my husband? He has become a beast. Look for men and women who are soft-hearted people. People whose hearts are contrite. People whose hearts are contrite, their hearts are broken. Anytime there is issue in your marriage, in your work, the next word that will come out is the counsel of God. The counsel of God, the wisdom of God. Unfortunately, there are not so many people like that. <laughs> but they are still available. Another thing that hardens Christians when you are under the leadership of a hardened pastor a hardened minister a hardened mentor there are many people they are not mentors they are tormentors and like i always said it is better to be mentorless than to fall victim of a tormentor If your pastor is a hardened person, no church, no set of believers can outgrow the values of their pastor. You will behave the same thing that he is doing. It is what you hear that you will believe. It is what you believe that you will behave. And it is what you behave you will become. That is the trajectory. <laughs> It is what you hear from that pastor that you will believe because faith comes by hearing and hearing by God's word. 
And it is what you believe that you will behave. It will shape your action. And eventually, what you behave, you become. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So, when you are under the leadership of a godly pastor, God-fearing man, amiable, very meek man, that man will multiply meekness in the church. He will multiply his values in the church. When the pastor is proud, arrogant, cocky, egocentric, he will multiply cockiness, egocentrism among members of the church. And then if those members are sent out to go and open branches of the church, they will multiply cockiness and then the thing will just begin to spread. So when you are in a church and your pastor is always boasting, and your pastor is always arrogating the glory of God to himself, and he's always telling you, where were you when I was laboring? Hey, it is not everybody that labors that ends up successful. There are people that are laboring for God inside Syria, inside Afghanistan, missionaries, by the grace of God, God has used us to help some of them. These guys have nothing. There was the time we were sending some little money to some missionaries in China. They were having churches underground, underground churches. These guys had no fame. They had no money. They had no clothes. In fact, some of them had no shoes. And they are laboring. Labor in the kingdom of God is not synonymous to wealth. The accumulation of money. No. That is why the Bible says the harvest is plenty. The laborers are few. Not the pastors are few. <laughs> it says the harvest is plenty. The laborers are few. It didn't say the pastors are few. Meaning that you can be a pastor and you are not a laborer. You are just an entertainer. A motivational speaker. You are just there to show your suit, show your color, the nice perfume you're wearing. I've been to Brazil. I was in Australia last week. I went to the presidency. That is what you are selling to the people. And that is not ministry. Ministry is service and sacrifice. Service and sacrifice. So if you're under a pastor or a mentor or an apostle or a bishop or an evangelist or anybody, and what they are modeling for you is egocentrism, pride, cockiness, and they stand before you as a role model for Christ. You are making a big mistake. You will replicate that value because every new generation is an improvement on the previous. Every new generation is an improvement on the previous. If I am a thief, God forbid, my son will be a grand commander. In that field, <laughs> that is how life is structured. Because children always take the baton from their parents and they run very far. If the parents have run 100 miles, the child may run 1,000 miles. Only a witch will be praying that a son will be lower than him. There is no father or mother who doesn't want their children to do more than them. And the same principle applies in scripture. Bad mentors will produce hardened Christians. Hardened mentors will produce hardened, stubborn, toughened, unbroken Christian. And it takes broken men to break men. It takes broken men to break men. So if we have the preponderance of pride, and egocentrism among believers in Africa. Let's look at the leaders. Let's look at the leaders and look at the entire African continent Nigeria, Ghana, Cameroon, Angola, uh, Benin Republic, all of the West African countries, South Africa, Zambia. And you see all kinds of horrendous things going on. What do you want the believers in the churches to do? They want to be like their pastor. Because naturally, 
Africans have a tendency of idolizing and adulating their leaders. It's an African thing. Idolatry is a very, very, very strong, strong siege in the African continent. We have the tendency to idolize things. It doesn't have to be passed. It can be anything. And Satan will take advantage of it to cause all manners of havoc. What can adding a believer? The last one on my list. Delayed discipline or judgment due to God's mercy. When you are doing things that are wrong and nothing is happening because you are, we are under grace. Anything you like, you are doing it. I had the story of a pastor a few days ago who has slept with virtually every member of the choir of his church. Virtually. At least 90% of them. At least. I am not exaggerating. Virtually every member. And the man is here alive. Now, what would that do to that man? He has become hardened. Because we are living under grace and the mercy of God because of Jesus. So, God's judgment that should be poured on us has been poured on Christ on the cross. So, when we commit sin in Christ, because we have an advocate, Jesus, we repent, we plead his blood, and then he forgives us. So, some believers take that as a liberty and they continue to sin. But my Bible told me, <laughs> my Bible told me, let me show you, show you that scripture. I will find it out now. Apostle Paul said, do not frustrate the grace of God. Let me show you the scripture. I don't want to misquote it. Do not frustrate the grace of God. I will give you the verse now. I don't want to misquote that verse of the Bible. See, Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. Apostle Paul was speaking to Christians who are born again, who are under grace, not to the Old Testament Christians. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God on my life. Meaning that grace can be frustrated. You as a believer can willingly. Number two, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30, also written by Paul, the grand commander of the grace movement. The same Paul that told us we have been called to freedom. Let nobody put you in bondage. He's writing now to the Ephesians. He said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit wherewith you have been sealed unto the day of promise. Meaning that do not get the Holy Spirit angry. Ah, so the Holy Spirit can be angry under the new covenants. Go and check it yourself. Ephesians 4 verse 30. You better don't let anybody deceive you. The God of the New Testament is not a docile God. Grace is not a license to behave anyhow. Grace in the language of Greek is translated as charisma. And charisma stands for empowerment. The power of God. So it is the power of God flowing through Christ when you receive Jesus to empower you to live above sin. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 12 says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us to shun sin, to shun ungodliness. Grace teaches us to shun ungodliness. Now, if grace is charisma in Greek, and charisma means empowerment, Titus 2.11 means the grace of God is empowering us to live above sin. So if you have received grace, you should live above sin. You should live above sin. Even if you make a mistake, you repent and you move on. I cannot help it. I cannot help it. I just love women that have this cough. I just love women that wear trousers. It's my weakness. You are not born again, brother. You are not. You are not. The Bible says, shall we continue in sin 
that grace may abound. I can't help when I see a man that is tall and dark. I begin to lose my composure. I can't help it. You are not born again, sister. You are not. It's very funny, but that's the truth. Because I've met people who tell me they cannot control themselves when they see a woman in, in jeans. Their body will be shaking. Say, you are not born again. <laughs> if you are saved in Christ, you will know that living in sin, sorry, acknowledging that you are not in control of yourself and you can do anything you like at any time because you are not in control, that is not the definition of a New Testament Christian. You are above sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There is this pastor in this eastern part of Nigeria. This story I'm sharing happened like 20 years ago, thereabout, long time ago. And it's a documented story. So if it is a private story that is hidden, I won't share it. I, won't sh I don't share people's private information on the public. But if it is documented, the newspaper carried the story. The whole country heard about the story. So I'm going to repeat and reinforce that story. Now, this pastor who was married was sleeping with another woman. And he was living in an adulterous relationship with another woman consistently. And he was married. So he went to a minister's conference. And the key speaker in that conference was a minister of God that I am close to. And this minister of God is a prophet. As soon as he stood up on his chair and was about to climb to the altar, he just stopped. So there is a man here. You are married. You are a pastor. You have been sleeping with another woman. God asked me to tell you to stop and repent. Otherwise, in the next one year, you will be a dead man. And the man began to preach his message. He finished the message and went back to his base. On the 365th day, exactly one year after, the man of God got a call. Newspaper, news media began to bombard it. They found a man on top of a woman in an hotel dead. They were having sex and the man died on top of the woman. By the time they investigated, it was this pastor. On the dot, the head of the Christian community in that state called this pastor that I'm close to and was screaming on the phone, Man of God, you said it, you said it, it has happened. The man died. What, what, what did I say? The man was confused. You remember you came to our meeting last year. The man checked the calendar on the dot the same day last year. The man died the same day this year, 365th day on top of another woman in an hotel and we are in the time of grace we are in the time of grace ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 do not grieve the holy spirit do not grieve the holy spirit do not grieve when the judgment and punishment of god is delayed there is a tendency for believers to take liberty for license and behave anyhow. And behave anyhow. And do anything. And that process adds people. Nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. Wow. Don't you know who I am? Before you were born, God has called me. Do you know how many people God has used me to help? Story. It is by grace. <laughs> Apostle Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. There is no human being on earth that qualifies to stand before God and boast. No matter what you have done, somebody else has done more than you or will come and do more than you. It was Rick, Rick Warren that said, every treasure will soon be trashed. There is no treasure that lasts for eternity. Every treasure will soon be trashed. So whatever God has used us to do, we thank God for it and we walk in humility because God can raise something else that we do what we have done and overshoot it and do more than what we have done. 
And it reminds me of the story that Rick Joyner shared. Rick Joyner said, a young man was boasting before God. I have been following you for the past 20 years. What have you done for me? I have been following you for the past 20 years. And the Holy Spirit spoke. You have been following me for the past two years. I have been dragging you along for the past 18 years. I mean, if I've been following you for the past 20 years. You have been following you for the past, following for the past two years. The remaining 18 years is war. Dragging you back and forth. You will not listen to me. It's argument and stubbornness. Argument and stubbornness. Argument and stubbornness. When the discipline and the chastising of God is withdrawn, believers in the New Testament take it as liberty and license to misbehave. There is no man of God that I know of, that I've read about, that I've related to personally, or at a distance, or that I've read about, who willingly, deliberately, intentionally, and with impunity, lives in sin, and doesn't pay a price for it. Write it down somewhere. Who there is not, not one anybody telling you and they're just pretending in their closer they are crying they are weeping they are begging god i'm sorry forgive me <laughs> and sin comes in any category different categories it could be anything now i'm not preaching i'm focusing so much on sin 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 though it's very critical i know that jesus has paid the price on the cross but I still have to balance my teaching. Here is grace. Here is responsibility. Grace is not a license to sin. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. I can grieve him. I can frustrate grace. Opposed to Paul the writer. Nobody wrote about grace more than Paul. And if you read those portions of the Bible that are sweet and very sweet, go and read the other parts that are sour. So you can have a balance. Check and balance. Check and balance. Check and balance. Let me be concluding. So when the sower was sowing the seed, and the seed fell on the ground that is a stony adding ground, it quickly produced result. Ah! And the Holy Spirit said, wait a minute there. Wait a minute. If you read Mark chapter 4, verse 6, when the seed fell on a hardened ground, Hardened at it quickly produced results, and that scripture says, Because they have no depth, they have no depth, they have no depth. And I was thinking, They have no depth. The Bible says in Psalm 42, verse 7, Deep calls to the deep, deep calls to the deep. God is a deep God. If you are a believer in Christ and you are shallow and you remain shallow, shallowness cannot completely sustainably access a deep god now when you are in fellowship with the holy spirit and you continue to love the holy spirit love jesus spend time with him follow him listen to him you are digging and going deeper the deeper you are going the more you'll be having access to epignosis what is epignosis epignosis is the greek word for knowledge and a big dose stands for complete and accurate knowledge. So when Paul was saying in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, Paul was saying that I may have a big gnosis, or put in another way, that I may have a complete and accurate knowledge of God. You will not have a complete and accurate knowledge of God as a Christian. The word of God will produce a different Christian in you. If you are not deep, because when you are deep, you are digging. You are digging. When they are trying to look for oil in different parts of the world, they take big equipment. They use a cell seismograph to check if there is oil. And they will be drilling down. The further they drill, the greater the chances. They can spend $1 billion to dig deep. Because when they get to that oil, they can mine, they can get oil that is going to be worth $100 billion. So the Bible says the deep cost to the deep. Shallowness cannot accept 
depth, depth of God. If you are a shallow Christian, very shallow, very shallow. And one of the characteristics of people who are very, 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 very ardent is that they are shallow. They believe they know everything. When they open their mouth and they talk, everybody will say, ah, what, what is he saying? What is this boy saying? What is he saying? When it fell on the stony ground, the Bible said because it had no depth, it quickly sprang up and produced. And the Lord said to me, wait a minute. One of the characteristics of believers that are, that have stony hearts or are hardened in their heart, quick results. Whoa. I can spend a whole month on this topic alone. Quick results. They have no value for process. No value for depth. No value for waiting. That is what greedy pastors have taken advantage of and they have manipulated and confused a lot of Christians. Give $10 today. Become a billionaire tomorrow. That is not the scripture. Give your salary today. Become Bill Gates tomorrow. It is not the gospel of the kingdom of God. I just explained to you now. Everybody that God has used, go and ask for their story. The world likes to celebrate glories of people. They don't like to hear the story. Behind every glory is a story. It's a story. Only babies celebrate products above process. Only babies celebrate products above process. I still said this thing in the UK when I was ministering the church three weeks ago. God gave Moses an instruction. Go and smite, sorry, go and speak to the rock. Moses was confused, frustrated by the Israelites. Moses got to the rock and Moses said, must we bring water out of the rock for you, you rebels? And he smote the rock twice. Now, I'm going to say two things now. The rock is a prophetic symbol of Jesus. Is a rock of ages. When God said, Go and speak to the rock, and Moses smote the rock twice, Moses didn't know he was violating one of God's primary and strategic agenda for humanity. Jesus was not supposed to be smitten twice, he was supposed to die on the cross once and once and for all. Because only by one offering will we be perfected forever. Hebrews 10, 14. But Moses carelessly, out of frustration, smote the rock twice. And God was upset with Moses. Moses pleaded for the Israelites. Many times, God forgave them. Many times, God wanted to wipe them up. Moses will stand in the gap. Don't do it. Don't do it. If you do it, the Egyptians will mock you. God will forgive the Israelites. But on this occasion, Moses begged God to a point. God said, do not talk about this matter again. I don't want to hear it again. And Moses ended his ministry. Did water come out or not? Yes. But what happened? Product-centric Christianity will never lead to depth. If you are a quick result, microwave believer, indomie Christian, and you do not want to wait for a day, for a month, for a year, or for whatever period to get anything from God, you will fall victim of false prophets. There are plenty of them. I was on Facebook last week and a pastor was selling anointing oil. And he said, I have got 120 bottles. And these bottles, the title of this anointing is instantly. Instantly. That is the title of this anointing oil. And people were calling him from Italy, from Germany, from America, from London. I want two bottles. I want five bottles. And the man said, there is nothing you touch that you will receive instant miracle. Anything, marriage, job, 
It is called instantly. I stumbled at the video. Normally, I would have shut it down, but I, I believe the Lord wanted me to listen so that I could see what is going on. And I was shaking my head. This man said, let me pray for you after the end of the selling of the oil. And he began to roll out incantation. Not one verse of the Bible. He didn't mention Jesus' name once. He was incantation. He was incantation. Because the sun has been put in the universe. So that the sun will appear before the moon. And the moon doesn't disobey the voice of the sun. And the stars and the moon, he was using horoscope spirit and chanting. And the people are saying, Amen. Amen. I said, Jesus Christ. They will carry that oil and apply it to their life and will receive sevenfold demons. The oil will cure high blood pressure and bring hepatitis and bring problems and demons will invade their lives. The man will make his money and run away to another place and sell the same oil. Most of these pastors have covenant with Satan to recruit people. Recruit people. So if you do not have debt and you are a quick success driven believer, the end time will be very odd. Very, very odd. When the sower drops the seed on the ardent ground, the Bible says quickly he sprang up and brought up plants. He sprouted up. Sprouted up immediately. Quick success. Instant results. Instant results. That is what has caused a lot of problem for many of us Africans. Myself and my wife, we talk about this this many times. You will see a white man. If that white man loves flower, he loves to plant flower, you will never see him. He will not abandon it. He will stay with that flower business for 40 years until he will become the greatest distributor of flower worldwide. Not we Africans. Once you start the flower business, three months, you don't make a, a profit, abandon it. You go to cement business. You sell the cement, six weeks, no progress, abandon it. You go to Dubai. You are buying things from Dubai. If the immigration people stop you, seize your goods, you stop that business. You go to hair making. Ah, no sin. It's now no sin. It's not pharmacy. You will not see a Christian, an African man or woman, within a space of 30 years, he has had 10 careers. 10 careers. 10 careers. And we are not planted and rooted. There is no multinational company that has existed since the 18th century that is owned by an African man. I went to Walmart, I think it was Walmart, some months back, and I bought, I bought conflicts. I bought conflicts. And I, I bought a Kellogg's conflicts. Because I love I love Kellogg's. So I bought a Kellogg's conflicts and I look at the back of the pack and I saw from 1852. I called my wife. I said, You can't believe what I see. I have seen. She said, What? This Kellogg's conflicts has been manufactured, has been produced. The company has existed since 1852. Come and see global branding. Coca-Cola, conflicts, Toyota, all of these brands. Their four, 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 four fathers, their owners have died many times over. Their great grandchildren, they pass it on, they build it, give to their children. You can't find such among Africans. It is the same spirit. Quick success syndrome. Quick success syndrome. And what is the main cause of it? The hearts of people are hardened. Hardness of hearts. Hardness. That is why the Bible is producing different Christians. South Korean believers are different from Nigerian believers. Ghanaian believers are different from Chinese believers. Go to China and see what people are going through for Christ. Sometimes I say, God, are you? am I going to the same heaven that these people are going to? Come and see people. The church auditoriums are full of water. Because of bad drainage, they will put their feet inside a river in the church and be jumping and shouting and celebrating with joy in their hearts. I read the story of John Wesley. John Wesley 
around 18 something, he was traveling in a ship. Traveling in a ship. And in that ship, there were some German Christians, missionaries, in that ship. Along the way, there was a wave, there was storm on the sea. And the ship was being rocked. Left, right. Left, right. And they were at the brink of capsizing. And John Wesley was afraid and shaking. And he started hearing a sound of a music in a particular part of the ship. When he went closer, he saw that the German Christians were the ones singing praise and worship. They did not miss one beat. Ah, he said, Igor, am I dreaming? They were at the brink of capsizing. The ship was rocking. Water was coming in. And some people are doing praise worship. He said they were laughing. They were singing, celebrating. John Wesley said he went to the leader. He said, are your husbands, sorry, are your men not afraid? The man said, no. Are your women not afraid? The man said, no. Ah, that was what transformed the life of John Wesley. As they landed from that boat, two years after, John Wesley abandoned everything, became a born again Christian and started preaching the gospel. He said, what kind of a zeal, what kind of a spirit we make a group of people to be at the jaws of death? They are at the brink, were at the brink of being swallowed by the sea. What kind of joy do they have? What they have, I want it. What they have, I want it. Those are the kind of Christians that the world has seen in the last hundred years. The Bible that produced those Christians should produce somebody like me, somebody like you, that will be like them. We must have comparatively similar values and standards. Strong Christians in Nigeria, strong Christians in Ghana, sound believers in America, so that collectively the body of Christ will be very formidable and strong. These are the kind of people that will fulfill the prophecy of Paul that the world is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Sons, not children, not babies, not kids. Sonship, sons of God. Sons of God, because only sons are given. God doesn't give babies to the world. Only sons are given. As solutions to the world, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Sons are given. God made sure that Jesus became a son. He didn't give Jesus out to go and die for the world at the age of 12. He made sure he was thoroughly prepared. 30, he took off. And he spent three and a half years. The world has not recovered. Hardened believers have no depth. No depth. Quick success. Quick results. It is working. If it is not working, they are always doing it. Only babies think like that. It is working. That is what has ruined Christianity in Africa. It is working. It is working. Witchcraft works. Arm robbery works. If everything that works is from God, then witchcrafts are from God too. Arm robbery is from God too. Why the same Bible produces different Christians? This is part two. As I round up, Mark chapter 4, verse 6 says, After the quick success, then the sun came. When the sun came, then the plants withered. It came out. And everybody saw the success of this man, of this woman. Though he doesn't have the depth, though his heart is hardened. After the sun came, everything came down. That is always the story. That is always the story. And the sun stands for the ease of life. You want to know if you are 
a Christian that has depth is when challenges of life come. When challenges of life come, that is when you know who is a Christian, a believer. There are degrees of troubles and challenges that people will endure and say, I am tired. I will go any length to solve this problem. I will go through any lens. And that is what reveals the character of Christ. That in the midst of waiting on God, you are doing a job of 2,000 pounds and you have qualifications to get a job of 7,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds. And all your friends who are not even believers in Christ, they have good jobs and making good money. And you are attending interviews all over the place. No one is giving you a job. What will you do? It brings frustration. It brings depression. I've got a master's degree. I went to Oxford. I've got this degree. I've got that. God is setting you up for glory. Anytime that kind of thing is happening, God is speaking to you. In fact, in many of the occasions, God is asking you to look higher, to go higher. There are many times people are looking for a job. <laughs> And actually, job is looking for them. God wants them to be employers of labor. So when you as a believer, you are going around the cycle in the same place for a long time, it may be an indication that the time is up for you to go higher. Go higher. Go higher. When Peter was struggling, the Bible says he struggled and labored all night. Luke chapter 5, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4. He didn't catch anything. Jesus said, launch out into the deep. Go deeper. You have been shallow before. You have to go deeper. You have been looking for a job of 7,000 pounds per month. It is now time for you to be employed people that you will be paying 7,000 pounds per month. So the idea God has given you is time for you to develop that idea. And God is going to give you favor. You get one office. You get three staffs. And then the business booms, and then God blesses you with money, and then you begin to employ consultant to work for you. There are people like that. The man that started KFC Chicken, he was fired from his job. KFC. The man was fired by his boss. He begged him. He applied for so many jobs. Okay, and he said, "I will start frying my own chicken." He was working for someone. Somebody was doing chicken before. So the little things he learned, he went to the shop, he bought some spices and some fish, and he seasoned the fish, and he, he rented a small kiosk, and the fish was being bought. People were eating, this is sweet, though. And every day, he was seeing queue, four, five, six people. They were came before him. Ah, the money was increasing, was increasing. KFC is a global brand now. That is always the portion of people who wait on God. Waiting on God is not wasting your time. Waiting on God is one of the qualities of matured Christianity. Not for babies. When the sun came, the growth of the adding Christian, the thing just came down. Just fell like a pack of cards. And I'm bringing this teaching to a close now. And I believe God has spoken to us this afternoon. The word of God, the Bible, should not produce different Christians. When believers get hardened and they become hardened and toughened, their conscience is toughened and hardened. They do anything they like. The word of God will not have any effect in their life. They become a law, a law unto themselves. Please help me share this message. It's going to bless and inspire someone. It's going to bless and inspire someone. I'm trusting the Lord that the Lord is going to use this message as an instrument of revival to steer up the heart of men and women to pursue God and stand up and walk with God with a deeper, deeper, deeper fellowship. The word of God is not a problem. 
the people and the problem. Bible is forever set. To, the word of God is for set to the ever. That is the word that God has. is glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth full of grace and truth that this world will become flesh that myself and yourself we will not just be the heirs of the world but will be doers the world will become flesh flesh in our hearts that any area of our act that is adding god is speaking to you the way you are talking to your husband is wrong. You are rude to your husband. You are rude to your wife. You are insulting, abusing your wife. That is not right. Go and apologize. And you say, oh, my dead body. No. It doesn't produce matured Christianity. It blocks access to the voice of God. And ultimately, if I cannot hear the voice of God, it will be difficult for me to access deeper things in God. When I need to consult God and pray and ask Him for insights, ideas, even when He's talking to me, I won't hear Him because I have become hardened. I have always been disobeying His voice, disobeying His voice on literally two issues. The day I need His counsel on very important matters of life, I can't hear Him. I can't hear him. And the world is like a wilderness. You are going for an interview. The Holy Spirit can speak to you. This question you answer. This question, don't wear this clothes. Change your clothes. Many times, the Lord says some things to me and I disobey. Disobey. And later on, because he's always right. And disobedience to the universe of God is serious penalty. Thank God for his mercies. Thank God for his mercies. Thank God for his mercies. And the word that God has brought to us this afternoon, this evening, is not from me to you. It's from him to us. From him to us. And I have been thoroughly challenged myself, thoroughly blessed, thoroughly reproved to straighten up my life and to ensure that I don't get hardened. Hardened hardened toughened toughened i must have a flexible soft heart a heart that has conscience a heart of love a heart that is responsive to the voice of god a heart that reads scripture with the high of truth i am not reading scriptures because i want to criticize people i'm reading it because i want to learn where am i wrong speak to me lord and i want god speaks to me I can apologize to people. Say, I'm very sorry, my sister. Please forgive me. I'm very sorry, my brother. Please forgive me. That is the kind of Christianity that can shape and change the world. In that context, the Bible will not produce different Christians. If all of us are like that. And I want to bring this to a close. I want to thank, thank everyone. Uh, everyone that has listened. Sister Shinwe. Pastor Shei, God bless you, sir. Brother Matthew, Sister Maureen, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. We are members of the same body of Christ. And uh, I'm so glad to be with you this evening again. Please help me share this teaching. It's going to bless someone tremendously. Please help me share it on the timeline. Saturday by 3 p.m. New York and Toronto time. 7 p.m. UK time. 8 p.m. West African time. We're going to be having our fire conference. And we will try as much as possible to broadcast all the sessions. But in particular, the session of the world will be broadcast 
and uh, the title is fullness of the spirit so by the grace of god i'll be bringing the first session of the word fullness of the spirit and another man of god will take the, sec the, the, the second session we're going to be praying for people praying for our nation and my latest book the gospel of the kingdom we are going to uh dedicate it again and uh we want to do it as much as possible around the world as the lord leads us we're going to do it and in august by the grace of god we're going to be in the u.s and dedicate it again in atlanta and we're trusting god for nigeria as well later in the year we're going to have we're still thinking about the plan uh and we are trusting god for support and help and finance to print as many copies as possible five thousand at least five thousand copies that we will release across nigeria and then so that we can use that book as a tool and instrument to disseminate the truth of the word of god and to tear up the consciousness of christians across nigeria to the reality of the gospel of the kingdom and it's my joy that the lord has used you and myself to be part of this move in this end time thank you so much everyone it's going to be 3 p.m toronto time so i think we are one hour behind uh manitoba manitoba is going to be 2 p.m your time sister maureen sister Nishola, god bless you man so i see you on saturday thank you so much everyone have a nice nice day a great afternoon i will see you very soon in christian love